Mr. Mr. Lord, welcome back to the channel, baby. Oh yeah, I'm back. So what you been doing, cowboy? I've been eating some honey. Mm -hmm. While buying nanogenomics has been dropping, I've increased my shareholding. I've doubled up. I've actually got 9,800 shares of bingo, so I'm just 200 shares off 10k now. Please remember, none of this is financial advice. It's for entertainment only. So I've been soaking up all of that pretty. Mm -hmm. We gonna get fine and dandy. While lots of growth stocks have been getting smashed recently, the genomics market has been taking a beating. Pack Bio down 77.97% in the last year. Bingo down 71% in the last year. And even Invitae down 85% in the last year. Bear in mind they reported a revenue of $460 million and this was for 2021. But they've got a market cap of $1.32 billion and last year they pulled in $460 million. Right now growth stocks across the board have been getting a beating but take a look at the predicted revenue of Invitae by 2026. They're saying an estimated $1.9 five billion dollars over on chart mills and i've been looking at chart mills and i noticed something recent with uh, chart mill they updated the 2022 guidance and it used to be 29 million dollars that was the estimate of what bingo's revenue is going to be for this year now they've cut this down to 26.5 million dollars but they've also added in 2026's revenue which is nearly 300 million dollars they're expecting large future growth within the next few years within one year they're saying the revenue growth is going to be 50 percent second year 64 percent third year 71 percent and over five years 75.6 percent another interesting thing to note is if we look at institutional share ownership we can see 28 percent i think it's nearly 29% yep 28.4% institutional shares and whilst there have been some institutions that have been exiting or decreasing the amount of shares they have with bio nanogenomics there's been other institutions that have actually increased one in particular really caught my eye now this one was Citadel I was looking at what Citadel has been doing so they've increased this was reported the 13f form on the 14th of February 2022 according to Fintel and they've increased their call options by 6%. They've decreased the amount of puts by 30% and if you look at their shares the accumulation has been wild 1229%. They're now sitting on 3.4 nearly 3.5 million shares and average cost basis of $4.72. So this is on Fintel. As you guys may know Citadel the hedge funds company. So some of these hedge funds are paying for alternative types of data known as alpha some of this data is web scraped, web crawling data, translational data, web and app tracking data, news and events data and economic data. But there are also lots of social sentiment data. So when they're paying for alpha, they can see often the movements and the sentiments of the retail market. So what I'm interested in looking at is uh, what Citadel chooses to do in terms of accumulation. If they're going to continue to accumulate bio nanogenomic shares and reduce their cost basis. In terms of genetics and genomics, what is going on over in England? Well, apparently they've test piloted and developed a bedside genetic test, which is saving children from losing their hearing. So there is a commonly used uh, antibiotic called gentamicin which is used for several types of bacterial infections and over on the NHS site this month they have said that a world first genetic test has been developed and successfully piloted in the NHS so it takes just 25 minutes you take a swab from the baby and so if a kid comes into hospital they're born and they have a serious infection or they're trying to prevent infection some of them are given gentamicin so it's safely used to treat about 100,000 babies a year but one in 500 babies carry a gene that can cause permanent hearing loss if they're given gentamicin so why is the NHS choosing to implement this kind of bedside genetic test and the reason is they want to see if these babies have this genetic variant and then they can be given an alternative antibiotic within the golden hour so they're not given gentamicin which could make them deaf and there's a lot of different treatments and innovation that are springing up within the NHS because they want to be at the forefront of things they want to deliver these cutting edge technologies and treatments to their patients to improve patient lives and improve patient care so in terms of pharmaceuticals and genomics and looking at certain genes when bio nanogenomics was first made it was made to actually map out the brca1 breast cancer gene 1 and breast cancer gene 2. So with precision medicine and pharmacogenomics coming through, so there's been this kind of movement coming through talking about modern medication saving millions of lives every year, but not every medication is good for everybody. It's not suitable for everyone. And while one medication might be good for someone, it may not work for you. So even if it works for other people, it could cause severe side effects for you. So when people are looking at genomics and pharmaceuticals and medications, they want to see how the genome 
influences your response to medications. Are you going to be at a greater risk of side effects? Do you need a higher dose? Some people need higher doses than others. How effective is the medication going to be for you? Are you even going to benefit from the treatment? You see, when we had that symposium, that bio-nanogenomics symposium back in January, there were some people from the pharmaceutical companies of Pfizer and AstraZeneca floating about. There was actually a senior scientist from AstraZeneca from the Gene Editing Safety Group talking about therapeutic cell and gene therapy development, and they were utilizing optical genome mapping by bionanogenomics. The gene therapy market is a huge growing market. It's set to hit $15.6 billion by 2030, having a compounded annual growth rate of 20% per year from 2021 to 2030, according to Globe Newswire and Precedence Research. Recently, we've had some other news here. It's talking about the largest study of whole genome sequencing data, giving new clues to causes of cancer. So they've said by analyzing NHS patients' data, they found a treasure trove of clues about the causes of cancer, talking about genetic mutations providing a personal history of damage and repair processes that each patient has been through. This could be anything from environmental causes of cancer, such as smoking or UV light, and that the team from Cambridge University Hospital were analysing 12,000 NHS cancer patients and they spotted 58 new mutational signatures. Whilst they were using whole genome sequencing, whole genome sequencing still doesn't give the full picture and with thousands of mutations per cancer, can bionanogenomics be utilised alongside this? So when I was looking at these mutational signatures, I opened a study and then I opened another study and people say that cancer is a disease of structural variation. When I opened the other study, it was talking about somatic mutations in cancer genomes. Somatic mutations are alterations in DNA which occur after after conception, the somatic mutations can occur in any of the cells of the body except germ cells, so the egg and sperm cell. And these alterations, these mutations, they don't always do, but they can cause cancer or other disease. So the next thing I did was look up optical genome mapping to see if they used it in a study with somatic structural variants. And I found this one from 2021 talking about next generation cytogenetics using optical genome mapping to assess hematological malignancy genomes. So they were using optical genome mapping for blood cancers and they wanted to study these somatic structural variants which are important drivers of cancer development and progression. Then I went back to UK and genomic scene in the UK and apparently the Daily Mail may not trust the Daily Mail but they have said the UK should offer £150 genomic testing so NHS patients can get personalised prescriptions. So if you were to offer £150 a pop, and this is for people who use the NHS, almost 56.4 million people use the NHS in England, and not all of them will pay for this service if they were to find out, you know, if certain medications work for them, and if they wanted to, you know, go into personalised medicine and try and see what will be the best medication for them to take. But if they did, for example, utilise that service, and if there was £150 a pop, 56.4 million people utilising £150 a pop is 8.4 billion pounds. Now there's always new medications being developed. Not all people would want this service as well, so it wouldn't be 56.4 million people spending. But for people that did want to find out, you know, whether or not codeine was effective for them. Apparently, according to this BBC article you can see here from the 29th of March, it's talking about matching drugs to DNA is the new era of medicine. And if you scroll down and go to this article, you can also see that more than 5 million people in the UK get no pain relief from codeine. And that's because their genetic code does not contain the instructions for making the enzyme that breaks down codeine into morphine. And without it, the drug is a dud. A lot of these professors as well, including a professor at the University of Liverpool, Professor Sir Man Nir Pira Mohammed has said we need to move away from a one drug and one dose fits all to a more personalized approach where patients are given the right drug at the right dose to improve the effectiveness and safety of medicines. Lord David Pryor said that this will revolutionize medicine. He said pharmacogenomics is the future and it can help us deliver a new modern personalized healthcare system fit for 2022. So what is the reason why drugs work for some people and they don't work in others? Apparently there are small differences in our genes. These differences mean that some people metabolize drugs faster than others and other individuals might require higher or lower dosages of the same drug to get the same effect, all depending on their genes. It can also include the genetic differences that change the amount of enzymes available to break down a medication or may cause the enzymes not to work. So drugs aren't equally effective for everybody and at the Royal Pharmaceutical Society the director for England called Ravi Sharma has said that genomics won't just transform medicine for pharmacy, it will transform medicine for the whole healthcare system. Over at Queen Mary's University of London, on their website, they're talking about the new report calling for personalised testing. And this is for safety and effectiveness as well for common medicines throughout the NHS. Now, in terms of AstraZeneca getting involved and utilising the Sapphire machine, 
but also Pfizer taking a look. Are they looking at personalized and precision medicine and they're utilizing optical genome mapping for it? Because they're definitely using it for gene therapy development. They're taking a look at it and seeing, you know, using optical genome mapping, are we able to create these new treatments? Some keywords as well, which is really important is the chair of NHS England, the National Health Service in England, Lord David Pryor, has said what he wants to do is actually make sure that pharmacogenomics is available to everybody. It must be funded centrally. It's too important to risk a postcode lottery. So it should be available to everyone, regardless of where you live in the UK. Now let's take a look at this short video on optical genome mapping, talking about cancer, for example, and certain treatments and how genetics can also affect certain treatments being given by doctors in hospitals. Patient A has recently given a biopsy to further investigate a potentially cancerous tissue. Their biopsy samples are sent to numerous centers to perform several different analyses, including histology, DNA sequencing, karyotyping, fluorescence in situ hybridization, and chromosomal microarray analysis, to name a few. Patient A's doctor, Dr. B, waits a minimum of two weeks to get the results back. The results indicate two major chromosomal aberrations, resulting in a translocation and indicative that patient A's biopsy sample does contain cancerous tissue. Based on these results, Dr. B suggests a first-line therapy, but unfortunately, patient A's condition worsens. Unknown to Dr. B or patient A, patient A's cancer actually had an additional small partial duplication, which allowed the cancer to evade the prescribed therapy. In complicated situations like this one, optical genome mapping presents as a promising alternative to existing test methods. Not only can optical genome mapping reveal the full scope of genomic variations within a cancer sample, but also has a shorter turnaround time. This can allow healthcare professionals like Dr. B to treat their patients faster with therapies more likely to successfully treat their cancer. Okay, so this is actually MHSC Medical Genomics, as you can see over here. So I was watching some videos on optical genome mapping and I came across that talking about certain treatments, medication and how optical genome mapping can help. And these guys made a part two and they were comparing it to gene sequencing and they wanted to show what optical genome mapping can bring to the game. So they were saying cost effectiveness, but also time. They can speed up things. Optical mapping can read single molecules with an average length of 300 kilobases. While this is possible with long read sequencing as well, with optical mapping, there's a definite cost advantage. Let me put this in perspective. 200x genome coverage costs about $500 for optical genome mapping when compared to $10,000 or $20,000 for whole genome sequencing with long read technologies. You've told me so many exciting things about optical genome mapping. But is there evidence for the utility of this technique in comparison to the current gold standard? Spoken like a true scientist, Anjali. So let's investigate how optical genome mapping actually performs. So there's been one single published study that has compared the validity of optical genome mapping for detection of constitutional abnormalities. 85 cases with 99 aberrations were detected by karyotyping, FISH, and chromosomal microarray and then the same cases were analyzed by optical genome mapping. There was 100% concordance when identifying simple aberrations and superior detection for delineating complex anomalies. When it comes to validating optical genome mapping for acquired abnormalities in cancer, especially hematological malignancies, six studies have compared its detection rate when it comes to numerical and structural variants with cytogenetic analysis. Together, these studies have included around 100 cases. Optical genome mapping was found to be superior to well-established techniques for resolution of more complex translocations. It also had a higher sensitivity for detection of copy number alterations. Additionally, optical genome mapping was able to detect new and unknown gene fusions. Overall, six of the seven studies showed close to 100% concordance between conventional cytogenetics and optical genome mapping. However, these studies also brought to light the limitations that need to be addressed in order to qualify optical genome mapping for clinical applications. In more than one study, structural variations of the telomeric segments and repetitive loci for some chromosomes was missed, leading to false negative results. Furthermore, a high throughput technique like optical genome mapping is unable to investigate sample contamination 
or mix up. Finally, optical genome mapping performs poorly with fixed stored samples used for cytogenetics and requires either fresh or frozen tissue with intact high molecular weight DNA. These limitations can be addressed to advance this technique to the clinic. Thank you very much for watching. Really appreciate you guys. Please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, drop me some comments and I'll catch you in the next video. Please also remember none of this is financial advice for entertainment only and I will see you soon. Mr. Over and out, baby.